welcome everybody to this um, first Zoom City Planning Committee meeting. Uh, we have in attendance full committee. So we have uh, Alderman Briscoe, Councillor Harvey, Alderman Barakas, Councillor Dutta, Councillor Coates. And I believe that Councillor Sherlock is here uh, watching, but uh, at this point in time, not participating. Um, so uh, unfortunately we couldn't, we can't, re well, we can't live stream right at the moment, but um, uh, we will try and release this afterwards. Uh, we have um, no reason to co-opt at the moment. Can I have uh, item two is confirmation of minutes. Happy to move, Chair. Thanks. Uh, I think that's Councillor Harvey. Uh, those in favour? Me. Aye. <laughs> those... <laughs> I think that was carried unanimously. Um, what, um, before we go on, um, given we have a number of deputations and they'll be, they'll be heard first, I'd like to uh, withdraw, um, move for withdrawal of 7.1.1 before, once we get to that, that uh, uh, moment before we have deputations and the deputations will run as, as it is on the deputation list. So 7.1.2. Point nine and then point three, which is 41 Alexander. Okay. Uh, so now we go to item three, consideration of supplementary items. So, so moved, uh, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Briscoe. Those in favour? Aye. <laughs> Those against? The motion carried. Uh, item five is transfer of agenda items. Any transfers? No transfers. Item six, planning authority items, considerations of items with deputations. So moved. So moved. Thanks. Thanks, Alderman Briscoe. Any dissent? No. Okay, that's carried. You can hear me okay? Yes. Good. That been clear. <laughs> Good. All right. Technology. All right. Um, item six is planning authority items, considerations of items with deputations. Can I have somebody move that? Yes. Happy to move. We hear the deputations. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Any dissent? No. So, um, Craig, you can let um, everybody in, I think, but um, item seven committee acting as a planning authority. I'll ask that um, uh, we move to 7.1.1, which is 10 William Wheel and Crescent, West Hobart. Can I have somebody move for withdrawal, please? Yes, I, I say moved. Uh, I think <laughs> Councillor Harvey's raised his hand. Um, those in favour? Right. Those against items carried. We move now to 7.1.2, which is 18 Aberdeen Street Glebe. It's uh, the driveway. Uh, Craig, do we have the representors or deputations? Uh, just having a look now. James Oakley is here. This is 7.1.2, sorry. Yes. So James Oakley is here, speaking on behalf of the trustees of the Diocese of Tasmania. Hello, James, welcome. Um, hi. Um, James, you have uh, five minutes to, to uh, address the committee and then the committee has, if they have any questions, um, we'll ask some questions after that. So if you'd like to go ahead, thank you. Thank you. I hope I won't take five minutes. Um, I uh, represent the trustees of the Diocese of Tasmania. I'm the secretary of that body. Uh, we're listed on title as the owners of the land. Um, the, the two primary concerns that we have in relation to our assets are to maximise the benefit of the asset for the purposes of the charity, so the Anglican Church in Tasmania, uh, obviously where there's an asset that can be used uh, towards our purposes, uh, we've got a, a responsibility under charities law to be able to maximise those benefits. 
Uh, second, a, a particular responsibility to limit liability, and that's uh, perhaps our primary concern in relation to the application that's before the committee tonight. Um, obviously, as a registered charity, we can't provide any benefit to people outside the purposes of the charity. So we need to uh, ensure that we're not providing a private benefit to any individual or group that's disconnected with the, um, the purposes for which we exist, which is the propagation of religion. Uh, my understanding is that the parish within which this uh, development is located has previously made representations to council about the improvements or the, uh, the gravel driveway that was built on the land, which I understand is um, not a legal development on that land and has led to the application before council at the moment. Uh, so it's an application that we oppose on the basis that it's a, an illegitimate use both of the land that's in our title and of a road reserve. Uh, we, the trustees recognise that there may be limitations to what uh, they can realise from the land given that it's a road reserve and not um, otherwise available for, for use generally. But there's still a residual concern about um, whether there would be some liability or the capacity for us to face some kind of liability if there were, if this development was permitted to go ahead. Um, one of the concerns obviously is that as the landholders, if anything were to happen, we'd potentially be named in any litigation. And so we would want to be sure that uh, that risk was non-existent for us if anything was to go ahead. Uh, the thinking of the trustees and the Anglican Church generally is that if uh, the council were minded to allow a development like this to proceed, one of the conditions would have to be that the, the land was transferred out of our ownership. Uh, I don't quite know how that would work, um, but, uh, and, and the lawyers that we consulted seem to indicate that it may be a situation with a subdivision that the council would have the right simply to take over um, ownership of the land. Uh, certainly that would be a possibility, um, but by and large, if there's any prospect of the land being transferred for valuable consideration, then that would be the preference of the trustees of the diocese. There's nothing further that I propose to say. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Thanks, James. Does anybody have any questions? If not, uh, thank you. And I'll move on to the next representor. Um, uh, Ms. Lillian Haynes, um, if you'd like to take yourself off mute and um, if you'd like to, to speak to the committee, uh, you have five minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes, fairly faintly. Okay, I'm not sure what to do about that. If I speak up, will you, is that better? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Okay, I'll just get a little bit closer. Um, Yes, um, I live at 19 Bailey Street with my husband, Richard Taylor. He's not available to um, join the meeting tonight, but um, we did want to um, talk about the development proposal with you and welcome the opportunity to do so. Um, as you may be aware, our property consists of a, pro um, a lot, lot 32, which, uh, lot 33, which fronts Bailey Street and lot 32, which is at the rear of our property. Do you see where that is? Lot 32 and 33, I'm not sure if you're looking at that, but anyway, so we have two titles to our property, lot 32 and lot 33. And um, in the past, we've spoken to a lawyer about our, uh, our uh, uh, the right of us to have access to our property in Lovett Street for lot 32. It's a separate title and it fronts onto Lovett Street and he assured us that uh, legally we have access and it can't be denied to our rear block. Now, um, when we initially got our drawing from David, uh, the developer, um, the drawing looked like it wouldn't allow access to our rear block, but there I can see in redrawn. The document that is attached to the minutes, can you hear me? No, you can't hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yep, keep going. Um, can you see my diagram? My picture of the drawing? Anyway, it's no, not- No, we can't see that. Is it, is it in the um, uh, item 
on uh, yes, the agenda? It's attachment E, but it's it's okay. Um, it looks like the developer has put in a different drawing, which now indicates that there is access to lot 32. So our initial objection really uh, is that um, it didn't allow access to lot 32. It's been redrawn. The design has been redrawn and now we have access. Uh, some little lines have been drawn in to give us access to lot 32. So, I mean, that was the, our original objection to the development. And now that our, um, it's been redrawn, I think we no longer can um, hold that objection. But I must say that in reading um, the documents that accompanied the minutes um, and the objections of other people from to the development, I, I've got to say that we do support leaving Lovett Street as it is. In speaking with the developer, he himself said, you know, it is a really, it's going to be really unsightly because it's going to be so big. <laughs> it's going to take over the whole top of Lovett Street. You know, it's almost right down the middle of Lovett Street. And, you know, it's one of the only green places in the Glebe. Um, it has historical value. Um, and I think that um, it should be retained for public use. So, okay. Can Thank I just you. say one other thing too? Yep, I, I certainly. I do wonder, and I think the previous speaker may have addressed it, I do wonder how a uh, owner of a private property in the Glebe can uh, use land that's owned by somebody else for their own private purpose. And um, I mean, that was raised by other people uh, in their submissions and I support that. Uh, I query that too, yeah. Thanks, Lillian. Is there any questions? Any questions from any of the the elected members? No, no questions. No. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you for that. I'll move to uh, Billy and Christine Badger. Mm -hmm. Lillian, idea. can you take your can you put your um, microphone on mute, please? Uh, yes. I'm not sure how I do that though. Oh, there it is. I see it. I see it. Got it. Okay. Hello. Good day. Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, for allowing us to um, have a little bit of input into this. I think we can probably agree with much of what uh, Lillian has said, and um, by the sounds of it too, with what the developer himself has, has um, according to Lillian, said, we've got nothing against the developers themselves, but we are pretty strongly opposed to this proposed development. Um, which, um, just for a bit of context, we are the owners of 20 Aberdeen Street, part owners of the body corporate that owns the property that would be directly bounding on the land in question. And I think we've got three main objections. We're opposed, um, firstly, and probably most importantly, to the destruction of the heritage value of this parkland area. Uh, secondly, I'd say that we object to the significant reduction of amenity for the wider Glebe and Hobart community in general, but then also for those property owners and residents immediately bounding this proposed development. And we're against, I guess, what amounts to the privatising and co-opting of a communal space for one develop developer's gain. And mm -hmm. I, th things, I think that first concern of ours is one that seems to be shared, just looking down through the documents, by many in the Glebe community that have become aware of the proposal. We live here because of the proximity to the domain, the city, but also because of this historical cultural heritage of this suburb. And we're opposed to the development as it brings about the, the demolition of the landscape elements and vegetation that contribute to this historic cultural heritage. And if you look at old photos you get from the 1800s, you can see very clearly that 18 Aberdeen Street, 19, 20 and 21 Aberdeen Street were the first houses in this area and the green space of Lovett Street is clearly visible in that. So I think we need to balance long-term cultural and natural heritage against short-term private gain. We think that Lovett Street, like Lillian said, needs to be retained undeveloped as it is, yeah. as we feel it's important to protect the valuable original cultural heritage that connects Glebe to the domain proper for future generations. And apart from this, I think our second concern regards the reduction in amenity that's currently enjoyed by all Glebe residents. It 
the proposed development, to, to my mind at least, serves to significantly increase the value of the property at 18 Aberdeen Street, providing it with further off-street parking, its own private road, but this comes at the expense of neighbouring residents who lose the natural tranquility that this parkland currently offers. Reasons why we, we all brought, bought the properties that we did in the first place. It also seems to um, provide a second entry, I think as Lily, Lillian was saying, to the property on Bailey Street. And both the property in Aberdeen Street and the Bailey Street have, as I can see it, um, off-street parking facilities already and sufficient access to the rear of the properties. And so it doesn't really seem to be needed from that point of view. Our property is directly adjacent to the proposed development on two sides and would be negatively impacted on two sides. Furthermore, I think importantly for the, the people in this immediate area is that a crossover for the developer's illegal gravel driveway was built during a recent footpath upgrade. And this has severely impacted the already fraught issue of parking in this part of Aberdeen Street. It's effectively eliminated two parking spaces in an area in an area that has already limited parking. Many residents have got more than one car. Commuters use the street as it currently offers free parking. So, by um, leaving this crossover and the, and um, having the driveway there, we're losing out a lot of parking space that we sorely need in this area. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, it seems the developer seeks to privatise an area that's currently and historically a communal space. And so the questions arise, around, uh, arise regarding the ownership of the land. The driveway is privately funded, yet the land it rests on is not privately owned. So the driveway would effectively be private land on a public highway, which appears to me to be problematic. Um, questions arise with regard to the legal right to use the land. Close to, to uh, ha uh, half of the top part of Lovett Street would be in private hands. So we, the Glebe community, lose the right to use and enjoy that land and any assurances that would come from the developer are short term and would be void if the current owner decided to sell or if the property passes into other hands. And finally, look, it would seem to me that the driveway is not really needed, but it's contrived perhaps as a way of preventing any further development that would negatively impact on his property. The developer has already an illegal driveway, a gravel driveway that never really gets used. And if you look at the plans, the developer hasn't proposed any associated infrastructure on um, his own property that would need to be accessed by a driveway. So um, we're against it for all of those reasons. And I think we could agree with many of the, the um, other complaints that came in uh, and objections that came in in the list of, um, was it somewhere around about 21 objections to the proposal. Thanks very much. Happy to take any questions anybody has. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions from any of the committee or other elected members? I welcome Councillor Ewan to the meeting. Any questions? Uh, Alderman Briscoe. Uh, yes, uh, just a question um, to Mr Badger. Um, uh, is the uh, Lovett Street used by the public now or is the owner restricted use? Um, well, it's used by the public as it is now. However, the the um, it it is so it's used by people that pass through there it's uh, used um, by children it's used playing. yeah i mean it's oh, just a green it's space it's a it's a green place. public space but it's used by the current um uh owner of 18 aberdeen street for wood storage um storage of a, a fairly derelict boat and a few other bits and bobs but um yeah, I mean, it's it's used in the way that any green space is is used in a community, Jeff. Uh, thank you for that. Look, uh, I was just trying to get the idea whether it is public space or is it the uh, trustees of um, of the church diocese uh, who've given public access to that area. But look, uh, that's probably a question for. Well, uh, it's Jeff. Just to be, it's it's um. You're probably not familiar with the area, but it's it's a. Uh, it's a green corridor between 
two streets and between uh, four houses, if you like. So it's as if it were a street, but it's, an, it's a green street. It's just a, a, a green area. Um, With so trees on so it, it's used by a yeah. lot of people that that walk through that area, and it, and I guess not everything needs to be used to be enjoyed. The very um, existence of it as a green space in a built-up area makes it of great use to everybody in the area. If you can, oh, I, look, I, me. I yeah. thank you for that. I'm sure it is a great use. <laughs> but I clarify whether the the owner has given permission for people to use it as a green space. But anyway. Well, I mean, he, the, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oakley, um, do you want to just answer that? Uh, the best answer that I can give is that the trustees have never restricted use of that space as a green space. And our understanding is that uh, because it's a road reserve, that it's open and available for use by the public as a road. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we Thank might you. go, if there are no further questions, uh, we'll, we'll go on to Ms. Amy Gardner. Amy, um, would you like to, to address the committee? Hi. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, make a deputation today. Um, I think it's important to note that the application currently before us was prompted by council enforcement action over the applicant's illegal demolition and works to the Lovett Street site and this occurred back in 2017. So my principal objections to the current application and also the existing works are on heritage grounds. Um, the Glebe is specifically identified as a heritage precinct under the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme and the Lovett Street Parkland encapsulates key identified elements of this heritage precinct. Specifically, it is a parkland space and its physical location further reinforces the Glebe's connection with the Queen's domain. The parkland is as important to the Glebe's heritage and streetscapes as its buildings are. Lovett Street has never been developed and offers the community almost like a time capsule from the earliest days of the Glebe's layout and construction. Accordingly, the existing and further proposed developments need to satisfy the E13.8 development standards in the planning scheme. E13.8.1 deals with demolition. The existing legal development and also the proposed further development will constitute a demolition of works on the Lovett Street site. The works involve damage or sorry that the development will involve the intentional damage to and destruction and removal of part of the works on Lovett Street and these works include historical landscaping the planting and the planting of trees that change the natural or existing condition or topography of the parkland space. These developments do not comply with the conditions of demolition in the scheme and involve significant alterations to the features of the Lovett Street parkland. Furthermore, the developments are not validated by the performance criteria P1 exceptions within the scheme, and they come at the expense of, greater community, of the greater community, which would lose a historic piece of parkland that has been a feature of their neighbourhood for over a century. If we go on to E13.8.2, that concerns buildings and works other than demolition. The development undertaken within a heritage precinct must be sympathetic to the character of the precinct. In other words, it must have a natural affinity or consonance or compatibility, compatibility with that character. The existing illegal development and the proposed further development will directly undermine key elements of the Glebe Heritage Precinct. By dis this will happen through the dissection and privatisation of one of its key parkland spaces. Furthermore, the visual continuity between this parkland space and the greenery leading up to the Queen's domain will be severed by the development. Furthermore, these developments do not comply with two specific performance criteria, P1 and P5. The works will result in a detriment to the historic heritage significance of the Glebe Heritage Precinct by commandeering and developing the Lovett Street parkland. Furthermore, the existing and proposed works will involve the removal of areas of landscaping between a dwelling and the street, Lovett Street. This removal results in the loss of elements of landscaping that contribute to the historic cultural significance, streetscape values and character of the Glebe Heritage Precinct. 
Elements of the Lovett Street parkland have been damaged through the current illegal development and this would be accentuated if the further proposed development were to be approved. In summary, the Hobart Interim Planning Scheme has clearly defined measures to protect Lovett Street and this application should be refused. In this event, I would also wish to see the Council ensure that the existing works are removed and remedied within a reasonable time and that all current private uses of the land for the storage of a boat, firewood and rubbish bins ceases immediately. Glebe residents have appreciated Lovett Street for generations. It has remained an undeveloped parkland available as an informal and green thoroughfare to the Queen's domain. While Lovett Street is protected by the development standards for heritage precincts, I would advocate for the site's formal recognition as a parkland reserve. This would bring ad added certainty that the site is for the benefit of the community as a whole and not solely for the adjoining residents. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. Uh, and I'll open it uh, to the elected members for any questions. Do you have any questions? N none from me. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to um, the next uh, representor, Ms. Yvonne Chaperon. Uh, Yvonne, could you um, speak, please? Thank you, Helen. Um, I, um, I have uh, put in a submission and I'm not going to um, go over what I've already put in. I'm taking that as read, but um, I do oppose the application and I agree with the sentiments um, from Mr. Badger and from Amy Gardner. Um, as we've heard from James, the, the land is owned by the trustees of the um, Diocese of Tasmania and managed by the council. And for those councillors who haven't visited um, this uh, particular parcel of land, it's on the high side of Glebe near the tennis centre. And the vista overlooking the city um, of Hobart is absolutely breathtaking. And it's, um, as we've heard, um, it's one of the last parcels of land in Glebe. Now, the building of a private driveway over a public asset essentially is privatising this parcel of land, which was not the intended use when entrusted to the council to manage. The planned driveway is large, as we've heard, and would absolutely ruin this parkland. Uh, it would prevent the residents of Glebe uh, from accessing it. And to comply, as we've heard from um, Amy, to comply with um, uh, construction um, laws, it would have to, um, it would need to comply with the highway and drainage requirements and would become a permanent sealed piece of land. Um, would, it would reduce the amenity and the demolition of the heritage status of the land. Uh, the application also states that the new driveway would provide access to the owners of um, 18 Aberdeen Street to access their rear property. Most people who live in Glebe are unable to access their backyards with vehicles and do not have driveways. And it's part of the trade-off of living in uh, the beautiful Glebe area. From the plans, the driveway also looks like a, a dual lane um, going into the back of 19 Bailey Street. And so I'm a little bit confused by um, Lillian Haynes's um, submission tonight in that um, the the plans benefit her the back of her property. It looks like it's a dual lane going into her backyard, um, and also slightly confused by her submission in that the the land should stay as a parkland reserve because and I know it's not part of this application, but it would appear that 19 Bailey Street has built a pathway on the reserve into the side of their property without council approval. So I'm slightly confused by um, uh, Ms Haynes, um, what she has said tonight. Um, we've also heard too um, that the applicant um, of 18 Aberdeen Street stores his uh, wooden boat, which is in disrepair on the property. He also stacks his firewood. My concerns are that the boat is in such disrepair that I fear that if any children play on the boat, it's huge liability, whether it's for the council or for the church, but um, it, it could um, result in some tragedy that, that someone could become quite um, hurt from a falling piece of wood from the boat. Uh, 
the development would also provide personal and private benefit, as we've heard, to the applicant while removing this asset from the community. I think that such a, a large construction would um, prevent people from uh, walking over the, the parkland. So it's my submission that the council should not approve the application and should go further in order that the gravel driveway that's currently there be removed and the ground restored and the wooden boat and firewood also be removed to enable the public of Blade to utilise this land safely. Um, there's also some um, steps that have been, uh, bricks that have been placed as steps that um, aren't cemented in, which are unsafe, that probably need to be removed. And um, I um, agree with um, Amy Gardner's um, uh, submission that the council should formalise recognition of um, this piece of land as a parkland reserve. Thanks, Helen. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I'll open it uh, up for questions. Are there any questions from elected members? No? Nope. None from me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll go then uh, to the applicant, Mr. David Reid. And David, um, you have uh, five minutes to uh, respond to some of the, the things raised. And, um, uh, and my apologies for not getting back to you when you uh, contacted me today. It's been a fairly busy day. So over to you. You have five minutes. You'll need to take yourself off mute. If you can, or I can. Uh, uh, we're not hearing you at the moment. Where are you? Uh, just wondering if we've if we've got a microphone, uh, Craig. He's unmuted now. Yes. Can you um, speak up, David? Not getting anything through, unfortunately. Um, any suggestions, Craig? No, it should be working. He's connected and un unmuted. Hmm. Right, well, that makes it rather difficult to hear uh, the uh, what the applicant uh, is saying in um, his defence. But um, if we can't hear it... Um, is, is it possible to give him a call to see what the issue is? Well, he's, he's on a phone, <laughs> uh, oh. so it may be difficult. Okay, yes, perhaps that's a good suggestion. Maybe um, can you call back, hang up and perhaps call back? Mr. Reid? Okay, we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> we'll just uh, take a few few minutes until we've sorted this out. Uh, bear with us. Uh, technology isn't isn't always as perfect as it uh, is made out to be. Hello. Hello. 
yes, we can hear you. So if you'd like, uh, sorry oh. about that. So if you'd like to, to speak, right. <laughs> we'll see how um, it goes. You have five minutes. Am I minutes. Very good. Um, can you still hear me like this? Is that better? Yes, that's fine. Far away. Yep. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to speak um, tonight. I'm very sorry about the um, um, delays and confusion. Um, I did send out a um, PowerPoint presentation to the members of the committee. I hope you had all received those. Is that a yes or can I talk to that um, PowerPoint presentation? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, all right. So um, with the PowerPoint presentation, I um, go through um, the context of um, what has happened. Um, I think it's been um, accepted that Lovett Street is a gazetted road um, owned by um, the Anglican uh, Church and um, uh, administered by the council. Um, five um, properties actually um, um, have access to um, Larbert Street um, and one property has its only access from Larbert Street. Um, when I purchased Aberdeen Street um, back in 1983, it was in two flats and the only access to the bottom flat um, um, at 18 Aberdeen Street was from Larbert Street. And in actual fact, um, uh, one of the tenants there uh, used to uh, park his motorbike in the back shed, so he had vehicular access um, over Lovett Street uh, for several years. Also, um, when we purchased 18 Aberdeen Street, 17 Aberdeen Street was on the market at the same time. We, in actual fact, ended up paying around about 16% more for the property at 18 Aberdeen Street, which is virtually identical to 17 Aberdeen Street, because it had vehicular access to the rear of the property. So in actual fact, we have already paid um, a premium for access from Lovett Street. Um, several adjacent property owners have maintained a significant portion of the road uh, to ensure that access is usable um, uh, for ourselves and the public to, uh, to walk through um, the area. If it wasn't for our mowing and the lawns, uh, probably a third of the year the grass would be too long and wet for anybody to be using it. Uh, the road surface has been made um, difficult, um, um, has made it difficult to ensure safe vehicular access to the um, back of our property at all times and at one stage uh, my son got bogged halfway down there um, and so I put some gravel uh, down to improve the safety of the area. There, I have no intention or desire to claim any, any new property rights over Lovett Street. Um, now, if you go to the second slide that we've got there, um, the current situation, the gravel I put down um, was designed basically to improve um, the safety of being able to drive down uh, Lovett Street, um, something which I've done um, virtually every year since we owned the property um, or since we've moved into the property in 1990. Um, so the way the driveway was designed was to have uh, minimum visual impact um, and to ensure that there are no issues of drainage on the street and so that it avoided any impact on trees. And the outcome, if you have a look at the photos that I um, have attached in the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation show before and after um, visuals of Lovett Street um, from both Bailey Street and from Aberdeen Street. I find it difficult to see that there was any change um, caused by um, the gravel which has been put down. Um, since the installation um, of the gravel, uh, there were major floods in 2018, which were um, the fourth highest um, hourly rainfall record in Hobart, and there was no reported damage um, uh, caused by drainage uh, caused by the gravel, uh, gravel that was laid. And there was also no impact on the trees. Now, Going on from there, the outcome um, of, re, um, of responding to council's requirements is to have a much more imposing development than um, I envisaged. Um, and the design includes having an impervious surface, either concrete or bitumen. It requires curb and channel, and also requires stormwater to be um, um, installed. These design elements mean more concentration of surface water drainage, more visual impact, more heritage impact, and more impact on the vegetation and the trees. 
after I put the gravel down, I was informed that I needed to develop an application. Sorry, was that a question or? Uh, no, it's, you have 30 seconds, so perhaps you might want to spend the rest of the time yeah. just um, answering some right. of the, the questions raised by uh, the representors, please. Well, yeah, in, in conclusion then, this um, development application um, is much more intrusive than is necessary. Um, it's detrimental to the surface water drainage, it's detrimental to the land, uh, landscape um, and trees and heritage, and I agree with many of the objections um, that have been raised. I'm looking for guidance actually on how to achieve a win-win solution that will make access from Lovett Street safer while um, protecting the above values. I'd be happy to comply with any council conditions on the development application um, that will ensure in the safety of access over Lovett Street, and alternatively, I will comply with the directive of council to submit a new, less intrusive um, development application along the lines of that originally shown in um, the original design in Appendix 1. Having listened to um, a lot of the comments, I would be um, um, interested in becoming involved with any moves to create a community garden um, in the uh, location. And I thought the um, recommendation of Amy Gardner to formalise um, the recognition as a parkland or as um, um, as a community garden um, uh, would be something well worth exploring. Right. I'm happy to answer any questions. Th thank you, Mr. Reid. Uh, Alderman Briscoe, we'll start with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, David, uh, I'm just trying to get uh, my head around. Uh, do you believe you have a common law right to access the back of your property from Lovett Street? Yes. Or some other legal thing? Well, I don't know whether it's common law or other, but I certainly have a legal right to access um, the uh, rear of my property from Lovett Street. I can show you, um, sorry, we won't go down that further. If that's an argument, we might have to have that as a much, much longer argument later. I, okay, I believe, I, believe I do have that right. You have that right. Have you got a right also yeah. to put a boat and uh, wood on the property? Well, as far as the boat goes, um, I would um, claim that it is curbside parking on an unmade road in the same way as um, many people throughout the um, city will park trailers or caravans um, on, a, um, on a council road. Good, thank you, Doug. Further questions? Uh, yes, Chair. Alderman Barakas. Uh, thank you. Um, there's, I notice in your PowerPoint presentation, you say that you applied for landowners, landlords approval to submit a DA in 2018, which was granted. Um, yes. It, we've now got a situation where the landowners are making representations against it, suggesting that they're, they're not happy with it. So I'm just curious, what's, what's happened between now and then? And, I'm just curious as to the situation where somebody owns a property, somebody else is, is, is an applicant for a DA for the property and the owner of the property um, is against the application. It just seems like a weird sort of turn of events. I'm just hoping you can explain that a bit better. It, it's a very convoluted um, legal situation. Um, basically, um, when Glebe was first subdivided back in the 1880s or 90s, um, what happened with subdivisions in those days was that the residual land uh, remained with the landowner. So all the streets um, basically in Glebe uh, remained with the church who was given the grant of land. So in actual fact, Lovett Street, Shoebridge Street, Bailey Street and Davenport Street um, are all actually owned by um, the uh, Anglican Church in Tasmania. Um, Three of those streets have been developed as um, normal roads. Um, Lovett Street hasn't. Um, so the church owns the land, but because it's been gazetted as a road, um, the, um, all the rights of um, ownership are in actual fact they are invested with the council. I then had to apply to the council as the landlord um, to um, get permission to put in the development application and that was granted by the council in, was it 2018, I think? Yes. Uh, just, just a quick follow-up Sorry, just a quick follow-up then. So whether it's the, and this will probably be some questions for the, for the officers as well, but the, 
the current application that's in front of us now, whether it's the council or whether it's the diocese that we're talking about, do you currently have landowner consent to this development application? I have landowner consent from the council um, and um, who has the rights to um, be able to grant that, as I understand it. Right, okay, thank you. Further questions? Uh, I Councillor have, Dutta? Uh, just, just an observation here I'm making. Uh, I've heard uh, um, all the parties, and uh, the question that I want to put uh, is uh, this. Have you had uh, discussions with the others about this and how it can be resolved? Um, you know, meaning the other objectors? Yes. Yes. Um, I have, um, with the um, uh, Mr. Badger, I've spoken with his wife several times, um, and certainly um, with the um, Lillian and Richard from 19 Bailey Street, um, I've spoken with them. Um, I think the key issue um, comes back to the situation of um, the the ownership. Um, at the moment, um, the church owns the land and council administers it as a roadway um, because it's being gazetted as a roadway. Um, if it is closed as a road, the church then has full rights to um, develop it and sell it as blocks of land. So the church will be the major benefactor if this is ever um, closed as a road and the community would lose out um, entirely on green space and things along those lines. Um, I would, um, I've spoken to a number of people, including those um, uh, two people I mentioned before from the Glebe, who would very much like to see it develop um, either as a walkway, pathway or, or community garden. Um, and I would be quite supportive of that, provided that I could still get um, access um, to the rear of my property. Um, now, whether that could be incorporated in a uh, walkway um, through um, the area, um, I would think that it could could be. But um, and if council can see a way of um, guaranteeing um, that uh, the road will be will remain a road in perpetuity, um, that would be a very very good win win situation. Any further questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I have a Councillor Sherlock. Uh, yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you very much for um, speaking to us today. Um, I just, I'm still a little bit confused, and, and you've, you've cut out a little bit, so perhaps I missed a little bit. But I'm a little bit confused with regards to the landowner versus the landlord. So you said that the um, the landowner is council, and you have obtained consent from the council, but the landlord has now disapproved? No, no. The landowner is the Anglican church. Right. But yep. the rights to the land vest with the council um, because it's been gazetted as a road. And council has um, given me um, approval to put in a development application and that still stands. Right. We might get um, Mr. Noy to answer that when when uh, we open the item once once uh, we've finished with the deputations, Councillor Sherlock. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, um, I'll thank you, Mr. Reid, and um, I'll open the item for discussion. Do we have a, a motion? Uh, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, it would be great if we could find a win-win situation here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. You don't have to go. <laughs> you can stay there. No, I don't listen. Have to go. I can listen no but to if, oh, if right, you can sorry. just, uh, we're just opening the item for discussion now. So if you will just, if you can mute yourself, um, that would yep. be good. <laughs> thank you. Is, All right. Is, so, Councillor Harvey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, question to Director Neil Noy. Um, could you just explain the ownership of this land? Is it treated like a road that's not there and with a gutter and a footpath that's not there? Uh, there was a suggestion that 
Mr. Reed, uh, Mr. Reed suggested he's using it to park his boat there like he would park a boat on a street somewhere else. Could you just clarify whether it's a um, property to property open space or whether in effect it has the elements of a road with a gutter and a footpath kind of, you know, that are not there? Yeah, um, thank, thank you. Uh... Uh, Councillor Harvey for that question. Um, Mr. Reed's description of the situation was a fairly accurate one so far as ownership is concerned. The, the land is owned by the, uh, the um, Anglican Church, uh, but we as the road authority have control over that land. And as a consequence, we had to issue uh, authority or the general manager rather had to issue authority to formally lodge an application to construct over that uh, road reserve so that that's the um, that's the land ownership uh, arrangements it's it's uh, a lot of road uh, titles are still uh, retained in the original um, grantee uh, and um, uh, but controlled by council in, in all uh, effect uh, because of uh, council acting as a road authority. Okay. So what legal rights, if any, does Mr. Reid have to park a boat there, stack wood there and request a, a drive? I know council has given landlord approval, like we've done with many, many, you know, uh, proposals. Yeah, look, landowner uh, approval is for the lodgement of the application. It doesn't uh, necessarily um, follow that it uh, is um, giving consent to the to the development. It's simply the lodging of the application. And in relation to the parking of um, you know boat tra uh, boat and uh, boat trailer, well. Those are subject to the uh, same sort of requirements um, in any road re uh, verge that you can't necessarily park a boat on a road verge. Uh, it doesn't, uh, just because it's a uh, road reserve does not necessarily give you the right to do that. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily agree with Mr. Reed's assertions that he has the right uh, to um, place those items uh, uh, within the road reserve simply because it's a road reserve. Okay, and final question to you, Director. Is there any legal right to access the back of the property at 18 Aberdeen via the, um, the park there? Look, we, it, we, he doesn't have uh, rights to construct uh, a, a, an access over that land uh, for the purposes of uh, gaining access to the rear of his property unless council gives him that right. And that's the purpose of this application. Okay, thank you. Yeah, can, I, um, can I clarify that, uh, Chair? Certainly, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Director, um, um, so you're saying he has no right of access to the rear of his property from what is designated a road reservation? Uh, that, that's correct. He doesn't have, uh, for the purposes of constructing an access, um, the road authority gives uh, that consent, which is council. Uh, and he doesn't, uh, as I understand it, uh, hence why he's lodged this application to gain that uh, formal authority uh, to construct that access. So just to uh, follow up, if he didn't construct the road, he may still have ability to access his rear of his property. If, if council gave him that authority, uh, so the, the one that's from Bailey Street, uh, the property that's internal, it can only be accessed by Lovett Street. It, would that be in a different situation, uh, the vacant block? It, well, they, uh, that uh, vacant lot has no other frontage to a public road, uh, unlike um, 18 
love it. Uh, 18, um, Aberdeen. Um, that that internal block is only as only frontage to Lovett Street, and we would uh, it would be still subject to the same process, and council would be uh, need to consider uh, the merits or otherwise of such a proposal. Uh, just sorry about this, uh, Chair, but I, I do have to get this clarified because no one's actually giving me a specific answer here. Uh, uh, Mr. Reid did mention um, uh, that uh, it was a flat before that people used to access. Would he, he have a common law right or a, uh, as a right or um, um, existing use right to access his rear property? Just leave aside the construction of any access road. Um, presumably, you would have access to the rear of the property from a road without, literally without uh, creating a road. He has uh, frontage to Lovett Street. There's now there's a, a question of um, access. In this instance, you, uh, I think you're alluding to vehicle access from Lovett Street. Yeah, well, he, uh, Mr. Reid did assert that uh, there was a flat there originally, and, and the flat occupant used the rear of the property to access the flat. Well, he, he may have done that, and I think it was a motorbike, so I don't know uh, what what uh, the arrangement was, but uh, I don't believe that there was any formal authority uh, given to access the rear of his property. All right, okay. Look, I think there's probably some legal issues here, but look, thank you for that. Mm. Thank you. Councillor Dutta? Yeah, uh, just, just a clarification. I'm still a bit unclear then. Uh, that um, is there a common law right uh, that hasn't come through clearly to me? I just need a clarification. Well, look, uh, it's my understanding, and whether um, Miss Abey can clarify it, but it doesn't mean that you can necessarily gain a vehicle access to your property from an unmade highway reservation. Okay, thank you, thank you. Ms. Abey, do you want to answer or add anything? I, uh, I don't have any comments to add, add to Mr. Noy's um, assessment of the, of the situation. While highway right, rights are um, common, common law rights to pass and repass on certain land, I think that has to be um, we have to take into account the fact that it's not a made surface and so it's different from a, a, a traditional road with gutters and footpaths and nature strips where we all understand which parts are designed for vehicles and which parts aren't. All right, thank you. Do we have any further questions? Uh, Councillor Harvey. I'm happy to move the recommendation, Chairman, uh, for refusal. I think the representatives of have demonstrated all that's necessary to me to um, to believe that this is not the right um, application that we should approve or an application we should approve. So I'll be supporting the officer's recommendation for refusal. And also I'd like to know from the director, what's the requirements if, um, if this is uh, recommended for refusal, uh, what's the requirements with regard to the boats and the gravel and the, the, the firewood? Will they need to be removed? Yeah, look, those matters are subject to enforcement proceedings, as I understand. So if the, um, yeah, most likely those items would have to be removed. All right, thanks. Alderman Barakas. Oh, thank, thank you, Chair. I've got a question for, for the Director. Um, <clears throat> so just the, 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 the issue of the landowner consent still is still a strange one to me. It seems that we're in a situation where the landowner themselves, being the uh, the diocese, haven't given consent. They're against the they're against the application, but nevertheless, landowner consent's been given through the through the council effectively because the council's managing it. So even though the landowner's against it, landowner consent's been given. Is that is that is that correct? Yes, it's a, a slightly unusual situation mm. where you effectively have. Um, 
to both the original owner and council as the uh, road authority that has uh, some control over the land. One uh, council has, or the general manager has agreed to the lodgement of this application. And I think the report did touch on that if council ultimately gave uh, planning approval for this, the diocese would be required to grant authority to the applicant to actually undertake the construction work as the original uh, landowner. So if this was to get, if this was hypothetically to get approved, if the Archdiocese was adamant that they were against this happening, that it'd almost be a moot, moot point there, wouldn't it? Uh, th yeah, that's that's my understanding. Oh, th thank you for that. Look, I'm not necessarily convinced by all the arguments surrounding heritage about, about this application, but at the same time, I think there are some sort of clear issues aside from the you know the property rights of the landowner. Um, and just the way that this is going to affect the, the, the neighbours in the area. Um, I, do, I do agree that this probably isn't appropriate. I think, um, you know, and if the applicant has said that he's open to talking with the, um, the neighbours and trying to bring forward something in the future that's more amenable to the neighbours, then maybe that's something that needs to happen. But in its current configuration, I think I'm happy to side with the officers with recommendations on this. Thank you. Any further comment from... Anybody else? Any, uh, Councillor Coates? Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, a, a question. Look, I understand the application in front of us now is specifically for, for, for this, um, but I, I guess uh, it does, in my mind, I just want to uh, clarify something, I guess, if I could ask a question through to the director. The, the vacant block sitting in between number 19 Bailey Street and number 19 Aberdeen Street, um, when and if, uh, that was ever sought to, to to be developed. Do they have any sort of, I mean, you know, it's a street, it's Lovett Street. I know it doesn't look like one because there's no street on there at the moment. But I mean, is it is it is this something where the reason Aberdeen Street has had a recommendation against us and it, and it um, is purely because they already have access to Aberdeen Street, um, whereas if it was that internal vacant lot. Essentially, it's a street, it's a gazette as a street. Um, the archdiocese has given it to council as a, a landowner, if you, land controller, if you like, and, um, and it would be a moot point. They would have a right to vehicular access to their property. Yeah, yeah. I mean, council would, would have to, con, uh, you know, it, con, consider um, any alternatives, of, of course, uh, for access. Uh, in in such an application, but uh, I suspect um, council would be obliged to afford some sort of uh, rights to access that internal lot. It, it's currently owned by the the the, the, the number nineteen, as I understand, uh, Bailey Street. So there may be other al alternative access uh, op options rather than L Lovett Street to access it. So. Um, it's a little bit of a hypothetical at this point in time. It hasn't been developed uh, since it was originally subdivided. So, um, it, you know, it, it may or may not occur. Yeah. Um, and I, the only follow-up to that, I guess, was um, it's been sort of asserted that there was a unit in the back of the um, 18 Aberdeen Street. Is that unit just, just, it just happened to be like a unit A, unit B. There's no actual separate title there. There's no... Um, yeah, that, that's that's correct. It, it, it most likely was a um, ancillary flat of some nature, and uh, it's it's certainly not a separate title. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'll I now think I'll put the the motion, and um, I'll, I'll put it um, uh, to ask if there's any dissent. If there's no dissent, then um, the the motion is passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we now go on to 7.1.9, 25 Mary Street, North Hobart. And uh, Ms. Jewel Downing, uh, if you'd like, you'd like to take yourself off mute, um, thanks for your patience. Uh, you have five minutes to address, address the committee. Thank you, Helen. Um, thank you, members. Um, I guess I'd just like to start uh, my deputation by bringing the attention of the committee to the disappointment 
and the concern I have with the fact that this matter's even got to this point. Um, this screen relates to the original plan, PLN 161137, which was subject to RMPAT appeal and negotiations related to that plan, and the screen in particular, which was the focus of that appeal to RMPAT. And I participated in that in good faith, um, and an agreement on the design was negotiated, agreed upon and signed by all parties and submitted to the council as amended plans. And this is detailed on page 495 of your papers, points 4.1, 4.2 and 4.3. And you can see that the current structure is significantly different to what was agreed to and signed for and submitted as amended plans. So the owners of 25 Mary Street have displayed what I see as a blatant and somewhat contemptuous disregard for the negotiated agreement. And that has led us to this point, and I believe it highlights the importance of the council to enforce compliance on agreed amended plans. And while I've been told by council employees that this sort of, un, what I see as unethical behaviour is unusual, there needs to be a process to manage the situation more effectively and curtailing the need for more time, more effort and more money to be spent on something that had been agreed to in writing through the RMPAT process. So I now draw your attention to 6.4 of attachment A, which is on page 499 of your agenda. And specifically, the proposal has been assessed against the requirements of part D, the inner residential zone and 13.0, the historic heritage code. And that's consistent, of course, with 8.10.1 that with discretionary, even discretionary applications at all standards are relevant. And the assessment that follows then in that report relates solely to the heritage aspects and it neglects the assessment against section D and the standards and requirements of the inner residential zone. My deputation therefore relates to this lack of assessment against part D and specifically um, I assert that the um, alteration has not been formally assessed against 11.4.2. And I'd like you now on the papers, just have a look at that top picture on page 494 and highlight that the, the, the window and the glazed door well below the screen. You can see a window further up, that's a, up on the top floor, that's the bedroom, not relevant to this, but you can just see the window and the glazed door below the screen that belongs to my house. And thus that screen that has been put up, which is very different to what was agreed to through the RMPAT process, it completely dominates the outlook and takes significant natural light from the north facing main living room. It's my only north facing window in the house. So the alteration does not meet standard 11.4.2 therefore as it causes an unreasonable loss of amenity by a reduction in sunlight to a habitable room. And as the officer points out, the houses are close here, less than three metres away from the screen, my room, and it provides the only northerly aspect and it has significant visual impact caused by the scale and bulk and proportions of the screen when viewed from the habitable room. So the assessment does not address the representation that I've put in. So what I want to point out to the committee is that approving this planning application has, that has been recommended, and if it is approved, it will lead to me lodging another appeal with our impact, which I'm hesitant to do because the applicant has shown that uh, their previous records says they won't adhere to any of the outcomes that come out. And so I'd like the council to make sure they take responsibility for a complete assessment of the application against all the applicable standards, not just the heritage. Um, but as I have done right through this process, I've always been there to offer possible amendments. And so I'll do so tonight, given that is within your power to do that. The one thing, there are two things that could be done quite easily here neither of which would be detrimental to the owner, would be to paint the exterior of the screen in the same colour as the original dwelling, which would also address the concerns of other representations, and to lower the height to 1.2 metres from its current height, which would reduce the impact that the screen has on reducing light, natural light to enter the habitable room. It would still be a long way from what was agreed through the RMPAP process, and I have concerns with that, but this has been dragging on for years and it would be nice to resolve it. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Jill. Uh, do you have, uh, do any of the elected members have questions at this point? 
No questions? Okay, uh, we'll go then to uh, the applicant, uh, Justin and Anna Mayo. Uh, are you? Oh, there? Hi, hi there. Oh, um, thank you, hi. My name's, can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you, hear you loud and clear. Oh, great. Um, my name's Anna Mayo and Justin Mayo, the other applicants here with me this evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all um, about our application. Um, just for the benefit of committee members, 25 Mary Street is our family home. Um, it does have a newer and an older component. The newer component um, essentially consists of a large living area and this opens up onto a deck and the application today relates to a privacy screen that is fixed to the deck closest to the boundary with 27 Mary Street. Um, the, the council documents do note, um, and I'm sure you're all aware of them, that the screen is entirely and well within the building envelope under clause 11.4.2A3 of the scheme relating to building setbacks. And as such, no issues of loss of amenity that may otherwise be associated with that, that criterion actually apply in this case. They don't arise for consideration. The screen also meets the acceptable solution identified in clause 11.4.6A1 of the scheme relating to privacy. The only matter that actually gives rise to a discretion invoked by the proposal is the extent to which it satisfies clauses 11, uh, sorry, E13.7.2, P1, P2, P3 and P4, and clauses E13.8.2, P1 and P2 of the Historic Heritage Code which of course is noted in the documents you have. It's our view and the view of Council's Heritage Officer that the proposal satisfies these clauses. Before moving on to the ways in which the proposal does satisfy those clauses, I just want to refer to the respondents, oh sorry, Ms Downing's um, claims about the planning permit um, matter. Um, you have background to this matter. Um, it's detailed in paragraph 4.2 of the reported attachment one. So the planning permit um, that did go to the Planning Appeals Tribunal related to significant renovations to our property. Building occurred throughout 2017 and 2018 in accordance with the plans. Certificates of completion and occupancy were issued in November 2018. Uh, we did meet with Council um, about the screen. Um, it had become very clear that despite everyone's best intentions, it was not actually achieving privacy for either party. Um, we met with council, we discussed the matter with them, and we left the meeting under the impression that we did not require council approval to move or otherwise alter the screen. And we erected the new screen on that basis, which of course was a misunderstanding or false understanding. We became aware that the understanding was incorrect and of the need for a planning permit only a few weeks ago when Council commenced enforcement action. We lodged an application for a planning permit as soon as possible, I believe within 24 hours after becoming aware of that action. Turning back to the heritage requirements, um, the screen is the minimum necessary in our view to achieve privacy between the properties and that's our main objective um, in, in installing it. It's well within the building envelope. It's no higher or longer than is necessary to achieve privacy for us and for our neighbour. It's a minor feature of the property. The screen is clearly visually subservient to and has no dominating impact on the original building. It's more than 10 metres from the front boundary and 1.6 metres from the side boundary. It's inset from the rear corner of the older part of the property and significantly lower than both the eaves of the newer part of the property and the roof peak of the older part of the property. The colour and materials of the screen have been chosen to be recessive in nature. They're reflective of materials used in the newer part of the property, including in particular balustrading to other parts of the deck, which was assessed and approved by council in 2016 as being complementary to the older part of the home. Under performance criteria 13.7.2 P3, the screen is readily identifiable as new work while still complementing the colour and materials of key features of the newer and older parts of the property. The screen is set in from the rear corner of the older part of the house by approximately 30 centimetres, and this provides a break between the old and the newer parts of the property. 
It's true the screen can be viewed from the street, but only through a very narrow gap between 25 and 27 Mary Street. It is well above eye height and goes unnoticed by the casual observer. Lastly, the colour and materials used are reflective of the colours and materials used within the local streetscape and precinct. There are several other streets in the, in the houses in the street, my apologies, each of which are heritage premises and located within the heritage precinct, which use similar colours and materials. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the proposal. Um, we came to have the matter resolved as quickly as possible and would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from elected members? I just have a, a, a question um, to you, um, Anna. Just, just um, uh, if, if uh, as the request is, has um, come through, um, if the uh, colour of of the um, side facing Ms Downing's place would be a different colour, would uh, the the screen would be a different colour? Would that have uh, any particular impact on on how uh, you might regard it, and and also that request to reduce it one point to one point two metres? Um, we'd need to investigate how we would go about changing the colour. But regardless of that, we would not agree to a reduction in height to 1.2 metres. Um, the screen is there because without the screen, when we're on the deck and in our own living area, we look directly into Miss Downing's kitchen um, area. <laughs> so it, it would be, it would, therefore she looks straight into us. So it would, it would achieve no purpose. All right, thank you. All right, um, any other further questions? Or I'll now open the item if there are no other questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, just a question for the for the um, director. The my understanding you just confirmed the construction the, the the is within the building height is within the building envelope. So therefore meets the acceptable solutions for those criteria, I understand. So they're not even really discretionary, are they? Uh, that, that's correct. Yeah, right. it's, it's compliant with the building envelope. So those perf well, uh, performance criteria don't apply. Okay, well, I'm, look, I'm happy just to, I'm happy to move the motion to get the conversation going on this and move the recommendations. Thank you. Further discussion? If there's no further discussion, uh, then is there any dissent? Oh, I think I'm the only one who uh, dissents. Um, I think there could be a better outcome than this. So um, I'm disappointed that we can't come up with some uh, some something that can improve um, neighbourly relations. Uh, Councillor Dutta. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I I descend. So I had my own. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. Okay. Look, I'll I'll go uh, in precedence then. Uh, and if you could answer uh, aye or no, aye or nay for the motion, uh, Alderman Briscoe. I support the motion. Councillor Harvey. Aye. Alderman Barakas? Aye. Councillor Dutta? Uh, no. Councillor Coates? Aye. And I vote against it as well. So that's uh, carried four votes to two. We now move on to uh, item 7.1.3, 41 Alexander Street, Sandy Bay. And I'll um, call on uh, Mick Arnold, if you can take yourself off mute and, and thanks for waiting. If, if you'd like to uh, present your, your position on this, uh, Mr Arnold, thank you. Uh, thank you for hearing me. Uh, I have two concerns related to the proposed boarding house application at 41 Alexander. Uh, it's, I guess, opinion shared by 17 or so other people have made representations in relation to both the heritage values of the house and the street 
and the uh, serious deficit in the provision of off-street parking places. So in relation to the heritage values, this, this is the third application for this address by the present owner. Uh, the first application hid the new building behind the existing roof line in keeping with the heritage values of what the council has already determined to be the best example of 1920s and 1930s housing in the city. Um, so I think that's probably worthy of some special consideration. This latest application has the new construction above the existing roof line and therefore visible from the street. So I would uh, argue that this isn't in keeping with the maintenance of this fine heritage listed street. Uh, I note the officer report throws that final decision back to councillors rather than give a definitive statement in support of that. Um, the second uh, issue is around off-street parking for uh, this application. Uh, so it seeks classification of this place as a boarding house instead of a multi-bedroom dwelling um, and therefore requiring potentially a smaller number of off-street parking places and no provision for visitor parking. But I, I don't believe this classification should be used to circumvent the intent of the planning scheme and the maintenance of amenity for existing residences. This will be an eight bedroom house providing only one existing off street parking place. Even in its present form, the, the, this application doesn't make adequate provision for the parking of intending residents. There's no allowance made for visitors, which, which should be there if it was correctly advertised as a multi bedroom application. If we're looking at an application for change of use to boarding house, which has clearly stated parking requirements in tables uh, E6.1, a parking place for the staff member and another place for the, the new three bedrooms uh, is required, but this application makes no provision for any new parking places. So if there's no requirement for a car, uh, if for a staff member parking, then it's not actually a boarding house. It's a multi-bedroom dwelling requiring car spaces for both residents and the provision of a visitor car space. But either way, this application is deficient by two car places and the planning scheme is obviously clearly written to prevent this from occurring. With uh, section E6.6.1, uh, number of car parking places, the objective is to make sure that there is the, the, there's enough uh, car parking to meet the reasonable ne needs of all users and it doesn't detract from uh, the amenity of users of the local uh, locality by preventing regular parking over spill. Um, I, I, with, with respect, I uh, would challenge the, the report that uh, the performance criteria are being met in relation to E6.6.1 A, B and E. So the number of car on-site car parking spaces must be sufficient to meet the reasonable needs of users having regard to all of the following. So I've specified car parking demand, the availability of on-street and public car parking in the locality, and the availability and suitability of alternative arrangements for car parking provision. I I'm sure you're aware that this is the, the street uh, just north of the university, and it's consequently used as free parking for students during university term, from early in the morning to late in the afternoon. We already have three addresses in Alexander Street, uh, 54, 56, and a battle axe uh, subdivision at the rear of both of those addresses, approved for multi-bedroom boarding houses. So we've got you know, 20 or so bedrooms with a, approximately six off-street street car parking spaces. Only one of these is in operation at present, and par parking for locals is already incredibly difficult. We're yet to experience the parking effect of those other two which have been approved and its effect on the street. If, we if you approve 41 Alexander as a boarding house, it will potentially put another seven cars on the street. Greater incidence of residents having to park several yes, steps yes, away. Yes. Greater incidence of residents therefore having to park several streets away in order to access their own homes. This application will make four boarding houses in an already overcrowded street with a few more developers who have multi-bedroom applications waiting in the wings. So I'm asking for that strict interpretation of the requirement of parking provision 
this application to make allowance for the street that's already under serious on on street parking duress. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Arnold. Um, I think you've made your, your points really clearly, um, uh, as we've seen in the representation, other representations as well. Uh, are there any questions of uh, Mr. Arnold? I, I have a question. Go ahead. Have, uh, the, the question is: Is there any public uh, car parking facilities in the area? Uh, on the assumption that uni isn't regarded as public car parking, then no. Thank you. Ottoman Barakas? Oh. Sorry, I thought you had a question. Any further questions uh, from elected members? Uh, Councillor yes. Coates? Um, uh, look, uh, I can understand the frustration. I, um, I remember uh, being near university and um, obviously in term time, every single street in that part of the world is, is full of cars. Um, do you have any inclination as to, I mean, from my point of view, um, it would seem to me an obvious thing to increase the value of the property would be to put off street parking in. Is it your view that the, um, uh, the developer hasn't sought to do that um, purely because uh, they feel that they will be using this as a as a as a sort of dormitory um, boarding house, and and that's that's a, I guess the reason is actually a, a you know their classification is correct in that sense. Uh, well, it's a five bedroom house at present. Um, extending that to eight uh, is is solely going to you know it's it's a multi bedroom dwelling rather than a a boarding house because we don't have an on site there's no on site caretaker. So I just think you know we're pro developer may be looking at seeking to circumvent the requirements of the planning scheme by doing it this way. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, it does. Look, I, I guess I'm, I'm, yeah, I was looking to posit the, the, the counterfactual, I guess, which would be that, I mean, why wouldn't they want to put sparking in? <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And that, that would be my concern also, like, uh, uh, while the uni is, it's intended to move that to, to the city, um, certainly the officer report says that this is likely to house university students, but the fact that and again, it's, it's in uh, Rob Cooper's report. The fact that there's limited parking in the street, now I don't know what that does to those potential residents of 41 Alexander. Where do they park? So there's, there's limited space already. It, it makes it almost impossible. Councillor Dutta, do you have questions? Um. No, I, I, I'm, I'm happy. I'd, I'd rather motion if, if the discussion is, uh, you know, is, is completed. I just have um, a question, uh, Mr. Arnold. Um, obviously, you've uh, and we've spoken about this. You've had concerns um, regarding the the other um, boarding house developments, and you're saying this is. Um, Going to be the the, the fourth. Um, is there any anything from a a longer term planning perspective that you would want us to consider as a council for this area? Uh, well, my greatest concern is you know at, at some stage this street. Well, I, I believe the street has reached its tipping point for occupancy anyway. Um, it, it's a house. It's a street that was constructed in the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties. There are a significant number of properties with no off-street parking. Um, it's under serious duress, obviously, through university term. Uh, and we've had applications at, at both 66 and 72 for multi-bedroom dwellings. I just don't know. Um, I, I would like to seek some assurance from council that at some stage, uh, council will say enough's enough. There are enough people living in this street. All right, thank you. So, um, if there are no further questions, I'll open the I, item for discussion. I, I have a motion. Oh. Who, uh, who are we, who's going? Waterman Barakas, is that you? Oh, look, if I, if, I, if I got in first, I'm happy to go. Um, look, I'm happy to move the recommendations, Chair, I think the... Um, the officer's report, I think, satisfies my concerns about the um, application, so I'm, I'm happy to move that. 
Chair, Ch Ch I thank you. I, and Mr. Arnold, can you would you mind muting yourself, please? Oh. Councillor Data. Yeah, I, I had uh, stated that I have a motion that I wanted to put uh, before um, Alderman Barakas came in. So I'm wondering procedurally, you know, where do we stand in this? I, I think it will have to be foreshadowed. Um, we have a motion before us right at the moment. Okay, thank you. Chairman? Councillor Harvey. A uh, question through you to the director. Just with, with regard to, to parking in that area, I'm assuming it's patrolled regularly by council officers. Is that correct? Do we have a, any idea of um, how often our, our parking inspectors frequent the area? Uh, look, look um, Councillor Harvey, I know understanding of how often it is patrolled. I do know that it is uh, subject to residential parking scheme. So re resident, residents in the area, permanent residents in the area um, that uh, have no off-street parking ha do have the ability to have a permit uh, to allow them to park in the street. Um, and we do review that system, you know, on, on a reasonable, uh, regular uh, basis to ensure that, um, that, that there is a sufficient uh, opportunity for those permit places to park on the street. I would add that that um, this proposal, if it was approved by council, wouldn't be entitled to uh, re residential parking permit um, for, for the occupants. Okay. So, and if this was a, just a normal residential development, um, would it have had any issues of going ahead, but because it's a boarding house or it was, um, you know, going to be a large share house, but if this had it been for a giant rumpus room and a, and a, a um, you know, um, other ancillary rooms for a house, would it have had um, uh, success in the DA? Well, if it was simply just an extension to an existing dwelling, then the only discretion that there would have been would have been for heritage and as um, the report outlines uh, cultural heritage officer is satisfied that the extension uh, does not compromise those qualities uh, that uh, of the precinct yeah okay look chairman i, I think i'll support the the, the um, application tonight um, i understand the issues with parking, I'm hopeful that whoever controls the boarding house um, will be able to issue a directive that you know they don't want to take people with cars. But I don't know how they would police that. But if there were cars parking there for longer than two hours, then I'm hoping that the council would be doing its uh, rounds regularly, like it should be doing around all of the university. But there are bigger parking issues around the university as well. I think it's a um, an ongoing and Yes. Uh, long problem of um, congestion and parking in that area, um, which needs to be resolved across across time somehow. But anyway, tonight I'll be supporting this application. Um, Chair, thank if you. I, if I might, Baracus. thank you, Chair. If I might just offer a point of clarification that might help alleviate some of the concerns of, of Councillor Harvey. Um, speaking from her speaking from um, experience, I can definitely say that those roads um, do get um, monitored and enforced by parking officers because it wasn't that long ago that I've received tickets there. So I, I do believe that they are actually monitored and um, I think given that the many of the units, especially during university times, I think um, on the off times, I'm not so sure, but during the, during the university times, I think they do get monitored reasonably frequently. So if that, if that helps alleviate some of your concerns about parking, then... Councillor Data. Yeah, I, I have a question um, through you to the director. Uh, is there a recent assessment report of the capacity and availability of the car uh, parking spaces for off-street parking in the area? Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. As I said, we do, uh, if we get complaints, 
we will review the residential parking uh, schemes within streets uh, where there might be increased demand uh, and we will allocate uh, spaces for residents under those circumstances or amend the allocation uh, to the re uh, residential uh, parking permit scheme. So, uh, but as for your question about off-street uh, parking uh, survey, no, I, I don't believe that we've necessarily done that within the residential, um, uh, within that residential area. Thank you. Uh, were you going to foreshadow a motion, Councillor Dutta? Sorry, yes, I was going to. What was that? Okay, um, the motion is that uh, pursuant to the interim planning scheme 2015, the proposal does not meet the acceptable solution or the performance criteria there is with respect to clause E661, because the number of on-site car parking spaces is not sufficient to meet the reasonable needs of users, having regard to the availability of on streets and public car parking in the locality. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? I might uh, just say that I, I believe that this is a really difficult uh, um, uh, and, and uh, is, has quite an impact on residents uh, in this area. This is a, a difficult one from a council perspective uh, because, I mean, it's an increase in density, um, but it doesn't seem to be meeting the concerns of the residents and it is not uh, the only change uh, of late uh, in this area. So um, it, it seems to be a compounding problem and, and perhaps we can, uh, Mr Noy, uh, consider how, uh, if, if anything, and it's a question to you, uh, how can we, uh, given we've, we have um, these, these um, rep repeating uh, changes, essential, essentially changes of use? Yes, it's a good question, uh, um, Chair. Look, the boarding house is a permitted use un under the scheme within this uh, residential zone, and that's something that the state government, um, um, you know, in terms of the the um, descriptions of the use, um, fairly tightly controls. So the scope to um, limit in some way boarding houses within this loca location uh, may be a challenge, uh, but uh, I'm happy for my team to um, provide further advice on that if that was what was the wish of the committee. Uh, certainly, I think it would be useful given we, uh, it's probably not going to be the last time that we hear of this. And uh, just a, a subsequent question, the, the foreshadowed motion, um, what sort of, uh, I mean, it's, it is um, obviously uh, according to the planning scheme, but what sort of likelihood would that have of, of being uh, defended at the tribunal? Yeah, look, look, based on the officer's uh, analysis, the, the, there's a discretion of one car parking space deficiency here. And it's the officer's view that that would be difficult to defend uh, at, at a tribunal. Um, uh, so I think um, the, the officer's position is would be fairly a strong one before the Planning Appeal Tribunal. Thank you. Are there any further questions or can we put the motion? I'll um, go through uh, the committee. So, uh, Autumn Risco, how do you vote? Uh, I, I support the motion for approval. Councillor Harvey? Aye. Autumn Baracus? Aye. Councillor Dutta? Uh, no. Councillor Coates? Aye. 
and I vote in favour of it as well. So it's carried uh, five votes to one. Uh, now that's the end of the deputations. Uh, I propose that we have a, a five minute uh, break. Um, if you're happy with that, any dissent? Happy? Okay, all right, two minute break. All right, just a, a quick, quick two minute break. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll get started. So I don't know if you're there, Councillor Harvey and Councillor Dutta, but um, if, ah, uh, yes, there you are. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we'll fire away. We're back to 7.1.4 on the agenda, which is 173 Fisher Avenue, change of use to visitor accommodation. Anybody have any questions of the director? Or anybody want to move the motion? I'm happy to move, Chair. Thanks, Alderman Barakas. Discussion? Chairman, I know um, we don't have uh, any grounds to refuse this. Is that correct? Through you to the director, Mr. Noy? Um, yes, that, that's correct. Uh, the, the only discretion, I think, with this one is the fact that it's got too much car parking. Um, so I think that um, that's not going to be a strong argument in any appeal. Maybe they could rent it to some of those folks in Alexander Street. Um, but look, but I, I don't think I'll be, look, I find it hard to support more and more air B and B. Um, so I won't be supporting it, not on planning though, but just I struggle to, to you know, to keep approving Airbnb accommodation in Hobart. I know that at the moment it's probably irrelevant because there's not many, not many tourists staying in anything. Um, but going forward into the future, I'd hate to think we end up back in the same predicament that we have been in the past, where we've had a serious housing shortage, uh, and a contributing factor to that is the growth in the in um, short stay accommodation. So I, I struggle to support these, even though they. Um, have, you know, well, there's no grounds on planning approval to refuse them. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? If not, I'll put the motion in that case. Uh, Alderman Briscoe. Hmm. Aye, aye. Councillor Harvey. No. Alderman Barakas. Aye. Councillor Data. Aye. Councillor Coates. Aye. And I vote in favour of it. Uh, motion is carried. Item 7.1.5 is 64 Anglesey Street. It's the C3 Church uh, car park. Do I have a motion? Or any questions? Oh, do you want to... Oh, Alderman, Alderman Briscoe. Unmute yourself. Can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. <laughs> well, I'm quite happy to move this, although there are concerns of the extent of car parking here. But there are. Uh, it's sort of like when there is a big event there, the car park, uh, the car um, are parked in all the streets in, in South Hobart around that area. So taking them off those streets is probably good for the residents. But there are. Some, I have sort of minimal concerns about the loss of bitter loss of. Uh, let's say the ambience of that area, but I think overall it will be okay. Further discussion? Has somebody moved the motion yet? Did, 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 did Dolman Briscoe just move the motion? No. Yes, I did. Oh, you did? Okay. Oh, no, okay. Look, I'll, I'll support the motion um, moved by Alderman Briscoe. I've been to a few events down there and seen how crazy you can get when there's when there's an overflow of parking, people start parking on the laneways and cars can't get in and out. And I think it's definitely a place that's in demand and they do hold quite a few events there. And I, th I think it's definitely something that would help uh, contribute to a solution in to some of the headaches that happen in that area. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, um, is there any dissent? Okay, I'll... Um, move oh, I'll um, move uh, <laughs> what am I doing um, I declare that carried unanimously 
Item 7.1.63, DeWitt Street, uh, Battery Point. It's the out outbuilding garage and studio discussion. It's quite a narrow driveway I, I noticed today, but um, I imagine that there's there's not too much traffic going in and out and we have the turntable there as well as part of the application. Happy to move Brax, are you moving that? Yep, moving it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dutton, did you want to say something? No, no, I was going to move, so he beat me to it. That's fine. No problem. All right, if there is no dissent on this or no discussion, then I shall put the motion. Those in favour? Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll carry the motion. Sorry, just have to get used to this. Uh, that That's carried unanimously. Item 7.1.7 is common land of the parent title at 1 Sandy Bay Road. Can I have somebody move that? Yeah, I'll move that one as well, Chair. Councillor Dutta, thank you. Discussion? No discussion. Uh, is there any dissent? Doesn't look like there's any dissent. Uh, I'll, um, I will take that as carried unanimously. 7.1.8, 17 Beach Road, Sandy Bay, demolition of new public toilets and associated works. I so move. Thank you, Councillor Dutta. Any discussion? No discussion. Take that as no dissent uh, and moved unanimously. We now go to, uh, do we, we continue as, um, we'll go to the supplementary items, um, supplementary agenda, sorry. So we'll go to item 12, which is 283 to 287 Liverpool Street on the supplementary agenda. I'm happy to move that for approval as the officer's recommendation. Uh, thank you, Alderman Briscoe. Any questions or discussion relating to this? Thanks, Chairman. Councillor yep. Harvey. Yeah, um, I'm satisfied that this development is a uh, quite a reasonable development, Liverpool Street there, 25 units. It's in a fairly industrial section of Hobart, only a couple of houses out the back which who have uh, concerns. But I think this development demonstrates some, some, some good urban design. Um, and what I'd like to say is it's good to have uh, uh, the developers uh, communicate well with the council and look for good outcomes rather than bringing things to council that they know may not get um, planning approval and keep pushing for it. But this is a good development and I'm glad to see that there hasn't been a lot of controversy around it. There's been only a handful of representations um, against it. Uh, so I, I think this is a quite a reasonable outcome for this site and for Hobart. So I'll be supporting it tonight. Thank you. Alderman Briscoe, did you want to say something? Uh, no. Any I, further? I, no, no, no. Uh, Okay, any further discussion? Uh, I'll just have a question, uh, Director. Um, the impact on, or the, the scale uh, in relation to the houses directly behind and, and impact, uh, given uh, I think it, it, um, it uh, goes over the, the building or uh, comes out of the building envelope on that that side I think um, is is do you feel that the impact is mitigated well enough yeah look I think the urban design advisory panel actually commended the applicant on the um, the way that they were able to demonstrate the transition between this development and the adjacent residential uh, properties uh, in Goulburn Street. Um, so I, I think that they've done a, a um, really um, put together a reasonably uh, considered uh, response, uh, development response here. Yes, it 
does project out of the building envelope, but when you assess it against the performance criteria in relation to the impact on adjacent residential amenity, I think that they've uh, demonstrated um, that uh, there will be minimal impact on the criteria that uh, that council has to assess uh, that impact against. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if there's no further comment or, or question, uh, is there any dissent? So uh, I think that's, um, I'll um, declare that carried unanimously. Uh, we move now to item 13, which is still on the supplementary, which is 29 Aberdeen Street. It's another change of use to visitor accommodation. I think it's come here because it's adjacent to, to council land. Um, Anybody want to move that item? Councillor Coates, thank you. Any discussion? If there's no discussion, I take that as uh, everybody's in favour. Uh, take that as unanimous. Oh, no. no. Uh, okay. Well, five one. I think you've got. I'll be voting against it. All right. Okay. Um, I'll go through the the item just for David's David's records. Alderman, um, the the lists. Uh, Alderman Briscoe. <laughs> you you were on. You're on mute now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. What's <laughs> <laughs> <I support> the motion? <laughs> Councillor Harvey. No. Uh, Alderman Rakus. Aye. Councillor Dutta? Yeah, four. Councillor Coates? Four. And I'll vote for, for that as well, just for the record. Uh, okay, we now go to reports. Uh, back to the standard agenda. And the first is a suggestion. Uh, so it's item eight, 8.1, proposed changes to delegations to determine development applications. And we have some suggestions uh, there. Can I uh, have yeah, a motion? I, I, oh, yeah, I, I suggest that, yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I suggest that it'll be, it'll be uh, um, maybe appropriate for us to think of uh, taking this to public consultation because it will, you know, involve the public and the ratepayers. So you're suggesting that um, uh, that uh, instead of just passing this, that um, we take it out for a period of a, f um, a few weeks for public consultation? Yes, yes, I'm suggesting that. I see. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Alderman Briscoe? Um, look, I uh, respectfully disagree with my colleague there, Councillor Dutta. These are administrative things to do with our committee. Um, we've always got the right to call in a uh, development. Um, I think uh, going from three to five, I think that's sensible, considering we get sometimes uh, the major controversial ones always get above five. Um, if, uh, as I said earlier, uh, if 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 a representative wants to come before the committee, they only have to approach one of us. So I, I suggest it's not a an item for um, public consultation. It's an item, a ministry of item that we consider as a committee and a council. Thank you. Any further discussion? Um, yes, Chair. Um, I'm inclined to agree with Alderman Briscoe. Um, I think it's very much like, as Alderman Briscoe said, if there are items that have less than the, um, the new number of um, uh, representations and it is something that uh, Councillor Dutta or anyone else around the chamber thinks is a important issue that needs to be discussed by committee or by or by the council rather than um, left to all the officer delegation. Um, every councillor and alderman has the right to to pull that item up regardless of the number of representation. So I think there's no real um, negative impact on on the community in regards to this. I just think it does help streamline the um, the process for us as elected members and for the council staff. I think it so allows it to, allows us to you know. Um, streamline that somewhat and if what like I said if there are items that um, any elected member thinks are of a public interest for us to be discussing as elected members um, anyone's free to pull it up whether it's zero one two three however many representations if it's not already on the list so look, I'll, I'll support the recommendations if it hasn't been moved I'll, I'll do so it's been moved ah. okay. 
uh, I think all uh, councillor Dutta moved moved it uh, with those with that change. Any further discussion? Uh, yes, thank what you. Uh, councillor Sherlock. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if someone could perhaps just give me the rationale behind um, those changes so with regards to um, increasing the number of the representations from three and then increase it to five. So, you know, point one, point two. I just, to clear it up in my head as to what the, the rationale was behind those changes. Well, the, um, sorry, Chair, I assume you'd like me to comment on, on that. Look, the, uh, the re clearly we're responding to a request from the committee and council to review these delegations. And I think it was uh, done with the uh, idea of reducing the number of applications that needed to be considered by council uh, and committee. And simply council officers have come to the um, conclusion that um, a proposed change could be to increase the number of um, re uh, deputations that would uh, see the, the matter go before uh, committee and council. I don't think that there's any greater science in relation to the number of representations. There was, however, in relation to uh, applications that were caught by the fact that they involve council land. I think there are a large number of those that are not contentious and are purely administrative uh, that go to council simply because it involves some work within the road reserve and we think that they are much greater um, benefit uh, for um, everyone if they were simply dealt with at officer level because they aren't contentious and uh, uh, and I think Alderman Barakas is correct that um, re reducing the need for those uh, types of applications to go before committee and council does increase the turnaround time of those applications. Thank you very much. I, I do appreciate you confirming that and um, yeah, thanks. I, I do um, also concur with Alderman Barakas's comments as well. Thank you very much for clarifying. Just a question, Chair. Go ahead. Um, just going off what was just said a, mi a moment ago, can we just clarify the the active motion that we, we're discussing right now? I'm just, just a bit confused about the... I must have missed uh, Councillor Dutta moving his motion. I just want to clarify what it is that we're discussing. So my, my uh, understanding from um, is the recommendation, uh, he's moved the recommendation, but, um, but has, has amended to seek public uh, input um, uh, in relation to these items. Oh, look, so in, that's in what the, we're considering. Sure, in, in that case, because I, I don't support that, I'm happy to foreshadow the motion as originally recommended in the officer's report. Um, and we, we can go through Councillor Dutta's motion and then move on to that. Thank you. Further comments? If there are no further comments, uh, I, um, uh, Alderman Briscoe, you have a so further comment? Just to clarify, so really we're deferring the decision. If uh, Alderman, uh, sorry, Councillor Dutta's motion gets up, we're, de we're uh, deferring the decision whether to change the delegations until we have public consultation. Is that my understanding or your understanding? It's to take it out for public consultation, is it not? Yeah, that's right. I, I thought you did say that we're, we're taking on board the officer's recommendation, we're going out to public consultation. We're just deferring a decision about delegations until we have public consultation on the suggestions. Is that your understanding of what the motion we are considering? So, <laughs> The, um, the recommendation as changed is that um, that the uh, we seek public input uh, before any changes are made on these changes. That's that's uh, my understanding. Is that correct, Councillor Dutta? That, that, that is correct. Okay. Um, I'll make some comments. I think um, I think Councillor Dutta has um, uh, brought some some. Um, 
good points uh, with with that uh, recommendation. It's it's really going to be uh, for for some of these things at least um, the 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 people who are going to be impacted are not so much uh, us around the table um but the community and having their say and i think any sort of uh perceived change um is and and we don't have to have um this committee uh we can act as a planning authority as a full council but we do have a committee structure and we do have the ability for for people to have a say and, and to be heard so uh whilst all of the things in these mooted changes, suggested changes, don't necessarily impact uh, the, the community directly, I think there are some things that do. So um, uh, unless there's further comment or discussion or questions, uh, I'll put the motion before us. Uh, is there any dissent? Yes. Yep, okay, so, all right, I'll... Um, I'll go through the list again. Uh, Alderman Briscoe, do you support the motion? No, I don't support uh, um, Councillor Dutta's motion. Okay. And um, Councillor Harvey? No. Alderman Barakas? No. Councillor Dutta? Uh, yes. Councillor Coates? No, no. Uh, and I um, support uh, Councillor Dutta's motion. So, um, the motion has lost four, four votes for t to two. Um, so we don't have a foreshadowed motion? I moved a foreshadowed motion. Oh, yeah. you did? Okay, all right. So, motion that's on the books. Okay, I don't know that we need uh, any further discussion. So um, I imagine that there's dissent, so I'll go through the list. Alderman Briscoe, do you support the motion? I support the motion. Councillor Harvey? Aye. Alderman Barakas? Yes. Councillor Dutta? No. Councillor Coates? Yes. Uh, and I don't support the motion. So the motion is carried. Uh, four votes to two, and it will go to, to full council. Um, 8.2 is monthly building statistics report. Can I have somebody move that be received and noted, please? Moved. Thanks, uh, Councillor Harvey. Discussion? No discussion, no dissent to carry that motion. Good. Uh, item 8.3 is delegated decisions report planning. Can I have somebody move that, please? I move. Thanks, Councillor Data. Any comments or questions? Any dissent? No, I'll uh, take that as carried unanimously. Item 8.3. Four is the city planning advertising report. Move that, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Barakas. Any anything of note there, Director? Um, we can't. We can't hear you, Director. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'd normally refer these uh, to Ms. Aby, if uh, Karen might like to outline any items that uh, of particular note. Uh, the most significant um, proposal on the list is a proposal at 11 Swan Street. Um, that is a building known as the Peacock Centre, which um, is a mental health facility which has been operated by the government previously. It was um, burnt down approximately four years ago and the government's in the process of redeveloping that. So that's um, uh, quite a substantial one. Oh, yeah. Do you, and there's also sorry, <laughs> a development at uh, 23 Enterprise Road, um, which is a proposal for 20 multiple dwellings. Um, that one has stirred up quite a lot of community interest. So that one will, will um, definitely be coming before the council. Can I just ask on that uh, Enterprise Road one, those 20 units, are they part of a, uh, a bigger proposal for that area? Will there be other developments along around there uh, that'll add you know, density along the same lines as those 20? Look, I'd, um I don't believe so, 
for Councillor Harvey. I think it's uh, limited in extent and uh, I think that this uh, proposal is within um, a general residential zone uh, and beyond that or above that is within a different uh, zoning regime which would limit um, the such uh, density of development. Okay, so this is on the border of that residential zone versus environmental living zone. That's my understanding. Further questions? I, I should, um, I don't know if I need to declare an interest for 11 Swan Street, but um, I'll just make it, Dave, if you can make a note of that. Thank you. Uh, so if there's no, uh, Councillor Dutton, did you have anything you wanted to say? No. No, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so um, I'll uh, take that as um, carried unanimously. Thank you. We're up to item nine, which which is responses to questions without notice. Can I have somebody move that? I move. Yes. Thanks, Alderman Briscoe. Well, <laughs> I, think I wonder if I could move all those uh, questions without notice. So one. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, any dissent? With that being moved, nope, thank you. All right, I'll uh, declare that uh, carried unanimously. Uh, item 10 is questions without notice. Do we have any questions without notice? Yeah, I've got a question. Councillor Harvey. Um, is it possible and desirable, you're getting this, David? Is it possible and desirable to introduce amendments to the planning scheme that would require all commercial developments to meet a carbon neutral requirement. So is it possible and desirable to introduce amendments to the planning scheme that would require all commercial developments to meet a carbon neutral requirement? Are you d addressing that to the director, I take it? Well, I assume it'd be on notice. You'll <laughs> you have an yes. I, well, unless you now, yeah, fine, yep. Yeah. yeah, look, I'll, I'll take that on notice. Thank you. And you got that, David? Thank you, Councillor Harvey. You have? Okay, thank you. All right, any further questions without notice? If not, uh, we go to, um, uh, can I ask somebody moves that we go into closed portion? I do. Thank you, Councillor Dutta. So I declare this part of the meeting closed.